questions orales, oral questions, the Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. We've learned that the gambling debts of the Liberal MP for Brampton East came to light as a result of a police wiretap. The wiretaps were part of an OPP investigation into, quote, particularly shady guys suspected of money laundering and terrorist financing. When did the Prime Minister's office first learn about this serious investigation involving a sitting Liberal Member of Parliament? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it was last week that we were informed and the member has told us that he is addressing certain challenges and receiving the treatment from a health professional. We re hope he receives the support that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Media reports indicate that the gambling debts of the Liberal MP for Brampton East were connected to a larger investigation involving laundering drug money destined for an extremist group in the Middle East. With an investigation touching on drugs, money laundering and international terrorism, it is simply not believable that no one in this government was made aware of this serious investigation. So I ask again, when did the Prime Minister or his office first learn about this serious crimes investigation involving a Liberal MP? The, the Honourable Member, the Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it was last week that we were informed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Chilliwack Hope. Mr. Speaker, that is simply unbelievable that the Prime Minister and his government were unaware of a major crimes investigation involving a Liberal Member of Parliament, an investigation involving drug money, an investigation involving international terrorism. This is an international incident involving national security. Does the Prime Minister really expect us to believe that an investigation of this nature would not have been red flagged to his office. When did he or his first learn of this serious criminal investigation into a sitting Liberal Member of Parliament? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as I have mentioned, it was last week that the member told us that he is addressing certain challenges and is receiving treatment from a health professional. We hope that he re receives the support that he needs. Mr. Speaker, the member knows very well that the government does not direct investigations of this nature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, I am seriously troubled by how lightly the Liberal government takes security. The OPP was investigating a shady individual suspected of money laundering and financing terrorist activities when they learned through their wiretaps about the significant debts of the Brampton East MP. The RCMP questioned the OPP about the huge sums of money being gambled by the MP at the casino. When was the PM informed of the RCMP's investigation? Not about his party, about the investigation into a member of his own party. The Honourable Government House Leader, Mr. Speaker, the member must be aware that the RCMP carries out its work independently from the government. The member told us last week that he was facing certain challenges and that he would be receiving treatment by a health professional. And we hope that he receives the treatment that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for megantic Lérable. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the gambling debts were known by the RCMP and the police. These debts were apparently connected to a broad investigation into drug money laundering, connected to a Middle Eastern extremist group. The Minister of Public Safety, the National Security Advisor, someone in this government must have known about the investigation involving a member of the Liberal government. When did the Prime Minister or his cabinet learn of that investigation? The Honourable Government House Leader. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the member must be aware of the fact that the RICMP works independently from the government. The member informed us last week of the fact that he was experiencing uh, challenges and that he was receiving treatment from a health professional. We hope that he receives the support that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for berthier Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, the news from Oshawa is devastating. 
GM is treating its workers with contempt. Worse still, the Liberal government could have known that GM was going to shut down. Rather than support Canadian families, they threw billions of dollars at rich corporations like GM with no guarantee of keeping jobs. Mr. Speaker, why do the Liberals continue to put the interests of large corporations before the well-being of Canadian workers? The Honourable Minister of Employment. The decision to close its Oshawa plant is extremely discouraging, and our thoughts are with the women and men who are affected and their families and their communities. We've heard that this is part of GM's global restructuring plan and may impact workers in the U.S. and globally. This is extremely troubling news, Mr. Speaker, and we feel for everyone who's impacted by this decision. Right now, our priority is auto workers and their families. We're working with all partners to support our auto workers, their families, and Oshawa during this difficult time. The Honourable Member for Berthier-Masquinongier. Well, we're asking for the government to stand up and fight for workers. Now, on another topic. Yesterday, dairy farmers across Canada asked this Prime Minister to not sign the USMCA until the U.S. oversight close on dairy classes has been removed. Our food sovereignty is at stake. Across Canada are asking this Prime Minister not to sign USMCA until the U.S. Oversight Clause on dairy classes has been removed. This clause will have devastating and crippling consequences on our industry here in Canada. Mr. Speaker, simple question. Will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and make sure that the Oversight Clause is removed quickly? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my Honourable colleague's question and concern, and she's fully aware that we have strongly supported the dairy and supply management system in this country. We have we made sure that the American attempts to destroy our supply management system did not succeed. We also understand that they they have some problems, and we're going to make sure they're fully and fairly supported. Mr. Speaker, we have and will continue to make sure that we support the supply management system in this country. Member for Essex. Well, that's not an answer for dairy farmers in Canada. Right. Liberals say they are on track to sign the USMCA tomorrow, but they don't even know what we're signing on to. Wording is changing, and the Canadian interpretation and the U.S. interpretation aren't lining up. No wonder this Prime Minister doesn't even want to attend the signing ceremony when we don't even know what the text is. Canadians know one thing for sure. If we sign with destructive steel and aluminum tariffs in place, we are losing our best chance to eliminate them. The reason reasons not to sign this deal are stacking up. Will the Prime Minister stand up for Canadian jobs and not sign this shifty agreement? Since the beginning has always been to get a good deal for Canada and for Canadians. We held for a good deal and we got a good deal. This agreement will be good for our economy, good for Canadian families and good for our middle class. It will preserve jobs, foster growth, expand the middle class and support people working hard to join in. Thank you. Remember for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just came from Washington, and Canada is being known for its concessions right now, and that's what that deal is about. And, Mr. Speaker, the decline of the automotive sector, including General Motors' most recent cutthroat tactics, has become routine business in Canada. Under successive Liberal regimes, Canada sunk to tenth in automotive manufacturing, with half a million jobs lost already. And nothing seems to move this government to urgency. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said he is considering a plan, despite being handed one a year ago from his automotive advisor, ironically funded by the workers fired. Can the Minister explain why the Prime Minister has done nothing? The Honourable Minister of Employment. It knows better. From day one, we've taken steps to make Canada's automotive manufacturing sector more globally com competitive and innovative, and we've proven our support for innovation in the auto sector because we know it drives economic growth and it creates opportunities for Canadians. Under our government, Canadian operations have received more than $5.6 billion in investments, creating and maintaining tens of thousands of good middle class jobs. Going forward, we have a plan, Mr. Speaker, for Canada to be global leaders in making cars of the future automated, connected, and clean. Honourable Opposition House Leader. 
Today we learned that the mess the Prime Minister created at the border will cost Canadians more than $1.1 billion, and that doesn't even include the millions of dollars it's going to cost the provinces. Now that's over a billion dollars that won't be spent on the priorities of Canadians. Priorities like helping our seniors, our veterans, or actual refugees whose lives depend on them being able to come to Canada. When will the Prime Minister own up to the fact that we have a big problem at our border and when will he fix it? Honourable Minister of Border Security. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Canada has a long and proud tradition of providing protection to those who need it most. If by providing refuge to the world's most vulnerable people, the suggestion that the global migration of, of the tens of millions of people fleeing pre persecution is the result of a tweet is kind of silly. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan, uh, and we have invested $173 million in, in ensuring that Canadian laws are upheld and that the security of our country is maintained. Mr. Speaker, the plan is working. We've seen significant reduction over the past several months of the number of people who are presenting themselves irregularly on our board. The Honourable Opposition House Leader, order. Well, the Prime Minister's tweet was not only silly, it was actually pretty stupid, and it's causing a lot of problems at our borders. In addition to the problems, Mr. Speaker, the crisis is causing huge delays for immigrants and refugees who are actually following the rules and wanting to come to Canada legally. So, Mr. Speaker, with a $1.2 billion price tag and actual refugees being forced to the back of the line, what's it going to take for this Prime Minister to realize the crisis at the border, which his tweet created, needs to be fixed? Honourable Minister of Border Security. Just an opportunity to clarify a, a misconception uh, promulgated by the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, those who are, are seeking uh, asylum in this country, who have asked for the protection of Canada, are, are processed through an entirely separate system than those who are awaiting uh, other, other streams of migration. There is no interference in those processes. And, Mr. Speaker, it's very important to, to recognize that we have actually made enormous progress under our current Minister of Immigration on Im improving response times, the processing times. Mr. Speaker, the system is working well. Honourable Member for Brandon Souris. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have failed to manage our border, Canadian border, and the price tag is staggering. By the end of next year, the Liberals will have spent $1.1 billion of taxpayers' money to deal with illegal border crossers, and that doesn't include any provincial money, Mr. Speaker. So why is the Prime Minister spending more money on illegal border crossers than on getting our homeless veterans off the streets? Honourable Minister of Border Security. Again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I, for all the rhetoric and hysteria that is now emerging about irregular migration, it's important to understand who these people are. Mr. Speaker, for example, nearly 40 per cent of the people who have presented themselves at our border seeking asylum are children. And, and Canada's response is to uphold the rule of law, to ensure that our processes are fast, fair and final, as well as efficient, and we deal with those individuals to ensure that they have adequate housing and shelter and are treated with the humanity that Canadians expect of us. Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. Mr. Speaker, these are numbers that come from the Independent Budget Officer of Canada. That's right. Truly, the entire refugee system in Canada is in a crisis and there is no end in sight regardless of what this minister says. If $1.1 billion and a six-year wait time, if it's working so well, you've got a six-year wait time, isn't enough to close the loophole, what number would it take before the Prime Minister realizes the Liberals have to do something to stop this crisis? Honourable Minister of Voter Security. M Mr. Speak Speaker, after uh, several years of significant cuts to both staffing and funding for the agencies responsible for managing this, both the CBSA, IRCC and IRB, and IRB we're, we're re-soaring the capacity of those institutions, agencies and departments to deal with this, to this issue. And, Mr. Speaker, the plan is working. As a result of our reinvestments, we have created real efficiencies in how these people are being processes, processed, and we're working diligently to find new and better ways to improve efficiency in this system so that we may uphold Canadian law, Canadian values, and our... The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, it's pretty funny 
to hear the minister say that we were cutting at the time. Yes, we rationalized, but there weren't problems at the time at the border. Now there are, and now it's costing $1.1 billion, and I'm not the one saying this. It's the parliamentary budget officer. And that doesn't even include the cost to the provinces. The Ontario and Quebec are spending another $5 million. So stop accusing us of everything. We deserve the truth. They should tell us exactly what's happening. And well, will the Prime Minister pull himself up by the bootstraps and do his job? Mr. Mr. Speaker, $400 million cuts. That's what happened. It led to problems at the borders. It increased wait times, and we have invested constructively in order to ensure that the border is safe and that we are fulfilling our international obli human rights obligations. Perhaps that's something my colleague isn't interested in, but in this side of the House, we are absolutely committed to the safety of our border and to respecting our international human rights obligations. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint jean Mr. Speaker. Is it an international responsibility to have all kinds of people getting flights to Nigeria and then here to cross the border? That has nothing to do with an international responsibility. Now, right now, it's $1.1 billion in federal funds and provincial funds to deal with this. And it doesn't end there. These people have to stop coming here illegally. So will the government pull itself up by the bootstraps and do its job? Okay. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague knows full well that that's what we're doing, and that's why asylum, the number of asylum seekers is going down. Now, my colleague also has an obligation. Before quoting statistics and engaging in all this rhetoric on asylum seekers, we want to point out that 40 per cent of the people who cross the border are children. And so, Mr. Harper's slashes reduced by $400 million the amount of money being spent on border security. I would ask the honourable member from Port Neuf, uh, Jacques Cartier, to not heckle when someone else has the floor. Valley. Mr. Speaker, there are two very important ways to mislead, either by the misrepresentation of facts or by the omission of important facts. Yesterday, I asked the Prime Minister very important and very specific questions. Exactly when he and his office first learned that the Member of Parliament from Brampton East was under RCMP investigation, he refused to fully answer the question. This is the same tragic pattern that Liberal Prime Ministers follow whenever facing scandal. So to the Prime Minister, who promised to be different, when did his office first learn that his MP was under police investigation? Here, here. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as I have clearly stated, as the Prime Minister also stated, it was last week that the member informed us that he was addressing certain challenges and is receiving the treatment from a health professional. We hope he receives the support that he needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Re repeating the same scripted non answers only raises the suspicion from Canadians that this Liberal government is hiding something. The Prime Minister promised to set the bar on ethics high. He said we must avoid any conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. The Liberal MP from Brampton East was appointed to the Finance Committee right. by the Prime Minister where he asked troubling questions of senior law enforcement officials about how to avoid detection. This raised, raised red flags with the RCMP. How do Liberals expect us that they saw nothing to worry about and that the media somehow know more about this scandal than the Prime Minister's own office does? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, that member is a seasoned elected official and he should know very well that the RCMP operates independently of government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. When I asked the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary for the Environment why his government was exempting large industrial corporations from its carbon tax, he replied that if they had to pay the tax, and quote, we could potentially have jobs leave and it will do nothing for emissions. It turns out for once the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary was absolutely right because the two largest export sectors in Canada, energy and autos, which aren't exempted, are now seeing jobs leave just as he predicted. So will they extend the exemption to protect the jobs of all Canadians? Honourable Minister of Environment. 
Mr. Speaker, it's extremely disappointing that the party opposite would politicize the loss of jobs at GM. It is a very disappointing situation. We will always stand up for workers, but I would encourage the member opposite to go to GM's website, where they support putting a price on pollution. Maybe they should figure out that it shouldn't be free to pollute, that we need to stand up for the environment, we need to stand up the economy, we need to stand up for our kids. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, if the GM really did support the Liberal carbon tax, why aren't they staying around to pay it? Exactly. <laughs> That's a very simple question. There will be no carbon tax on GM because they're leaving and they won't have to pay the carbon tax. They're leaving behind the workers who will have to pay the carbon tax and other businesses that will have to pay the carbon tax. But the wealthy CEOs, they're always happy to leave and leave the cost behind for everyone else. When will they start standing up for workers and for consumers and give them a break from this costly Liberal carbon tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, once again, it's unfortunate to see the politicization of this, this economic decision that has affected a number of different countries, Mr. Speaker, including the United States uh, and South Korea. Mr. Speaker, we are, we are standing up for Canadian workers. We are examining all possibilities. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, GM retains a very large footprint in Canada, and as a government, we are investing in the auto sector across Canada, but in particular in Ontario, to maintain high-quality jobs and to make sure that we are ready, Mr. Speaker, for the car of the future. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The problem, Mr. Speaker, is that the Liberal Party's plan doesn't work. Investments in Canada have been in free fall. 66% more of Canadians are investing in the United States. The Americans are investing a lot less here, 50% left, and private investment has dropped. Those are the results of the famous Liberal plan. Why does the government persist in putting up roadblocks for our investors? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker. What the Honourable Colleague said is false. We are investing in the auto sector in Canada. We have attracted about 400 uh, million, with $400 million, we have attracted about $5 billion throughout our mandate. So it is incorrect to say that we are not attracting investment. Mr. Speaker, through our Strategic Innovation Fund, we are creating opportunities for Canadian technology and for Canadian families and workers. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about this sort of liberal magical thinking. There are a couple of thousand people who lost their jobs in the auto sector and, and another few thousand lost theirs in the aerospace sector. So there's this magical way of thinking on the part of the Liberals. They think budgets balance themselves. So I'm asking the government, when will the, gov when will the budget finally balance itself? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the uh, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to recall uh, to my colleague, who I debated in 2015 about the recession, is this. The, the Conservative government left us with policies that were a complete failure. I, I really don't have the appropriate words to describe the extent of the failure in terms of growth, in terms of job creation, in terms of export growth, a social deficit, Mr. Speaker. They never reduced inequalities. They just made those inequalities deeper. So we have no lessons to be learned from the Conservative uh, Liberals for their previous government. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, yesterday our leader Jagmeet Singh was very pleased to take part in a meeting with all party leaders in order to discuss the issues faced by Franco-Ontarians. Everyone agreed that uh, there was a threat to the empowerment of Francophones in Ontario. Where are the new measures to protect Franco-Ontarians? What are people waiting for? When will the Liberals make a public announcement that they can and will fund 50 per cent of the Francophone University in Toronto? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We did have a good meeting yesterday. The Prime Minister, the leaders of the parties, and I myself was present at the meeting 
which took part, which took a part entirely in French. So, with respect to the French language university, we are looking at plans in the department uh, at official languages. We're looking at it, but, but we are there for Franco Ontarians. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roi, Mr. Speaker, given that the fight against climate change is the most important flight on this planet, more than 230,000 people have signed the Pact for tra the Transition. This movement is nonpartisan and asked signatories to make certain individual efforts, but especially asked the federal government to do so. Our leader, Jagmeet Singh, signed the Pact and has committed to honour his commitment. When will the minister present an environmental plan that involves all departments of government? Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate everyone for efforts to fight for the environment. We, but we have a plan. We have a plan of investing in renewables, of putting a price on pollution, of in. Uh, making historic investments in public transit, in green infrastructure and clean technologies. We want to work green and we want to work with the NDP and it would be even better if we had the Conservatives with us. Mr. Speaker, the Williams Treaty's First Nations have been fighting in court for more than 25 years to redress injustices involving compensation land and harvesting rights dating back to 1923. Our government understands that negotiation rather than litigation is the best way to right historical wrongs and settle past grievances. Out-of-court negotiations began in March 2017. Can the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations update this House on the efforts made by our government to accelerate reconciliation with the Williams Treaty's First Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister. I'd like to thank the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for her question and her advocacy. Earlier this month, I was honoured to celebrate with the Williams Treaty Chiefs, community members, the Government of Ontario at the celebration to settle all of these long-standing claims. Achieved through dialogue and in partnership it includes financial compensation, recognition of treaty harvesting rights and entitlement to add additional reserve lands. Canada and Ontario apologize for the negative impacts of these treaties. As Chief Kelly LaRocque has said, the settlement agreement marks the beginning of healing for our people. Honourable Member for Oshawa. Mr. Speaker, since the Liberals took office, we've seen the biggest decline in Canadian energy investments in 70 years. Because of excessive taxes and regulations, investors no longer see Canada as a good investment. But the impacts of the Prime Minister's policies affect every sector. This was made clear when General Motors decided to talk to stop production at our award-winning plant in Oshawa. These policies jeopardize thousands of good-paying Canadian jobs. Why is the Prime Minister choosing to impose taxes and regulations that will deter investment in our economy and provide no hope for workers in Oshawa? Where's his plan? The Honourable Parliament, the Secretary of the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, once again, I repeat that our, our hearts go out to the men and women who have been affected by the GM closure in Oshawa. As the Conservatives well know, Mr. Speaker, this decision was part of GM's global restructuring plan affecting their operations across the border and around the world. I would point out, Mr. Speaker, to the Honourable Member that we have doubled the jobs created in, in the auto sector over the last three years. We've done more in three years for the auto sector than they were able to do in ten years, Mr. Speaker, and we've attracted billions of dollars in investment, $3.3 billion in the auto sector in our first three years. Honourable Member for Halliburton, Quartal Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, in a recent ranking of 80 energy producing jurisdictions, BC dropped to 58th and Alberta dropped 29 spots to 43rd. Respondents blame high costs of regulatory compliance, taxes and energy. Now. Ontario is feeling liberal economic mismanagement. In its fourth straight month of decline, the manufacturing sector is at its slowest pace in two years. Right. Why is the Prime Minister heading down the road of higher taxes, increased energy costs, and burdensome regulations that will only further deter investments? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, once again, we'll, we'll take no lessons from the other side in terms of attracting investments in our manufacturing sector. 
We took, Mr. Speaker, the old automotive in, uh, innovation fund, which was underused in the Harper years because it was so hard to use, and we have recreated the new strategic innovation fund, which are, we are applying across a variety of sectors, but in particular the manufacturing sector uh, in Ontario and in other parts of the country. We have invested in a super cluster in, in southwestern Ontario that precisely looks at advanced manufacturing. Right. Mr. Speaker, we are doing a great job at, at promoting our manufacturing. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, on June 17, 2014, Conservatives approved the Northern Gateway Pipeline to export to the Asia Pacific. On November 2019, 2016, this Liberal Prime Minister cancelled the Northern Gateway Pipeline. He had a choice, but he outright killed that pipeline, which could have prevented the current price discount on Canadian oil. When the Liberals were elected, three companies planned to build pipelines in Canada. The Liberals chase them all away. So will the Liberals immediately withdraw their No More Pipelines Bill C-69? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, we are focused on getting our energy sector up and running and investing in, in, in our energy sector. That's why, at this moment, the Minister of Natural Resources is in discussions with Indigenous communities in BC to make sure that the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline moves forward in the right way, something that the Conservatives don't understand and never got. For them, it's a suggestion to obviously have that discussion with the Indigenous communities. We know that the economy and the environment can go hand in hand. We know that we have to have this meaningful consultations with Indigenous communities to move forward. That is exactly what we're doing. Honourable Member for Lakeland. But the Liberals killed Northern Gateway and Energy East, the two pipelines to new markets, and they failed to get a single shovel in the ground for Trans Mountain. They created this crisis. Now they're passing the No More Pipelines Bill C-69, which will do exactly what that name says. It will make sure no new pipeline is ever proposed or built in Canada again. Premiers, the private sector, economists and experts all agree. So if anything that member just said was true, he would scrap Bill C-69 today. Will he do it? Will he get rid of no more pipelines, Bill C-69? Yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Speaker, the reason why we need Bill 69 is for industry to know before they start the project what the rules and regulations are to make sure that when they're investing, the rules are clear. For, under the previous government, they would play rules, they would play games, and they have no, no record to show for it. Over in, 20, in 2006, basically 99% of our oil went to the United States. In 2015, guess what? 99% of oil seems, keeps going to the United States. We will take no lessons of how to do it from the previous government. Oh, okay. Order. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. What's the point of rushing through accessibility legislation if the government isn't going to put the money where their mouth is, Mr. Speaker? The Liberals keep failing Canadians who live with disabilities. And in the fall economic update, there's no mention of new obligations, let alone funding, for the CRTC to maintain their existing responsibilities. This is unfair, and it's insulting to Canadians waiting for implementation of Bill C-81. Why won't the Liberals take their responsibility seriously and ensure that institutions like the CRTC are accessible to everyone? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our goal is to make accessibility a reality across federal jurisdictions so that all people, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, can fully participate and be included in society. Bill C-81 will help us reach that goal. This legislation represents a significant historic advancement in federal disability rights legislation. Our government will provide $290 million over six years to further the objectives of the new legislation once it is given royal assent. I am proud that our government has delivered on this important mandate commitment. The Honourable Member for Desnethi, Mississippi, Churchill River. Mr. Speaker, one year ago, the Prime Minister said everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. Northern communities don't believe it because most of them still can't be accessed by highway year-round and people still live in overcrowded homes and are falling apart or covered in mold. Liberals keep neglecting Northerners. Why don't they invest the billions needed now 
to close the housing gap on reserves and in northern communities. Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question and for raising this incredibly important issue. We have made major investments to increase infrastructure on reserves, as well as for Indigenous Canadians who live off reserve. We have invested an additional $200 million a year for First Nations housing. We are working with the Assembly of First Nations on a strategy. We have invested $500 million a year over the next $500 million over the next 10 years for Métis. An additional $400 million uh, over 10 years for Inuit. We are building houses. Honourable Member for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. The Transport Minister claims he has never heard any concerns about the Liberal carbon tax. Yet we know. The National Airlines Council of Canada has said, and I quote, introducing a national carbon tax would exacerbate Canadian aviation's already severe competitiveness problems. And the CEO of WestJet has said, and I quote, they need to be very careful that they don't kill an industry that is so important to economic growth. Does the minister still claim he's never heard these concerns? I think what Canadians want to know is, did the uh, party opposite read the UN climate report? Do they understand that climate change is real? Do they understand the economic impact? There was just a report in the United States by climate scientists and by federal U.S. agencies said that the U.S. is at risk of losing 10 percent of its economy to the impacts of climate change. We also have a $30 trillion opportunity of clean growth. I would wish that the party opposite would understand that climate change is real, that we need a serious plan, that we need to take action and that's to grow our economy and also protect our environment. What is your plan? Order. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. She'll get her chance in 10 months to answer questions, Mr. Speaker. It seems every other member in this House is hearing the negative effects of the carbon tax except this Liberal front bench. Canadian manufacturers and exporters said, and I quote, the federal carbon pricing system as it is structured further weakens our investment position. The Canadian Trucking Alliance said, and I quote, the federal system creates competitive issues between Canadian and U.S. carriers. Does the Transport Minister still claim he hasn't heard these questions? Concerns. Wow. Well, Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask again, does the party opposite understand just how serious climate change is? Does the party opposite understand the $30 trillion economic opportunity of climate, cha climate action? We need to act. We need to do it because it is the right thing to do for our environment. It is the right thing to do for our economy. It is the right thing to do for our kids. Everyone wants to know, what is the Conservative Party's climate plan? Terrible order. 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 The Honourable Member for Edmonton Riverbend. Families in my community aren't polluters, Mr. Speaker. The St. John's Board of Trade, the Chamber of Marine Commerce, multiple municipal associations, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the National Airline Council of Canada, these are all stakeholders who have publicly said the carbon tax will hurt their businesses. Will the Transport Minister start listening to the concerns of Canadian businesses, or does he still claim he can't hear them? Honourable Minister of Environment. grow the economy and you can tackle climate change. And guess what? We're doing it. Our emissions are going down and we're growing the economy. With Canadians, we have created more than 550,000 jobs. Our economy is the fastest growing in the G7 and we're taking serious action to tackle climate change. I'm extremely proud that next week I will be going to the climate negotiations in Poland where we're going to take action with the international community to tackle climate change. We owe it to our environment, we owe it to the economy and we owe it to our kids. The Honourable Member for Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, now more than ever in this country, we need to stand up and take action to defend and strengthen our two official languages. Canadians understand the importance of protecting our rights and our official languages, and they know it is part of their government's responsibilities towards our national identity. Can the Minister of National Defence? Tell us about the actions taken to ensure women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces thrive in an environment where both official languages are equally valued. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, that I do not speak French does not lessen my commitment to bilingualism. As promised in our defense policy, Strong, Secure, Engaged, we restored the Royal Military College in Saint-Jean. We restored its status as a university degree-granting institution. We are giving ourselves the tools to recruit the best talents from Quebec and Francophones from Canada. to have a friendly house. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan's Milkman Nicola. Mr. Speaker, New Zealand is the latest security ally of Canada that has done the right thing and will ban Huawei from their 5G networks. Yet these Liberals refuse to put the security of Canadians first and do the same. Now, given that the Chinese government access or giving Chinese access to our 5G network is both irresponsible and wrong, when will this government join our allies, allies and say no way? To Huawei. Yeah. Honourable Parliament, the Secretary to Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, our government is open to investment that will grow our economy and create good middle class jobs, but never, Mr. Speaker, at the expense of our national security. Right. When it comes to telecommunication services, we promised Canadians uh, we would improve quality, coverage, and price of their services no matter where they live. 5G is an emerging technology that's an important part of us meeting that promise and to meet the explosion of consumer and industrial demand for faster and higher capacity mobile networks. But we want to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we will follow the advice of our public security officials and we will work only with partners who pass muster with them. A member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, six months after flooding devastated their community, the people of Grand Forks are still recovering from the impacts of that flood. And with winter settling in and the next potential flood only six months away, they are extremely anxious to get a firm commitment of support from the federal government. So can this government commit to working with the people of Grand Forks and the Boundary to support their recovery and mitigation efforts through infrastructure and public safety programs? Good question. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, the Government of Canada uh, always stands ready to support uh, provinces when they are working with local communities to deal with the, uh, the aftermath of natural disasters. Uh, the provinces and the municipalities have the, have the first line of responsibility to determine what is necessary, but they call upon the Government of Canada to assist them, including with the disaster financial assistance arrangements, and the Government of Canada will always, in every case, be there. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand the importance of high-growth mining companies and supporting middle-class families and helping us transition to a clean economy. I hear from resource exploration companies that greater investment certainty would ensure that Canada attracts more of the finite pool of resource exploration dollars available globally. In light of the fall economic statement, can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources update us on recent actions this government is taking to protect Canada's position as a top destination for exploration and mining. Thank you. Mr. Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the member for St. John's East for an excellent question and his really hard work here. In in the fall economic statement, our government extended the mineral exploration tax credit for five years. This extension will provide junior mining companies and investors with greater certainty, which is vital for the future mines. It will create good middle-class jobs for Canadians, including in Northern Ontario. So, Speaker, we are bolstering the sector's competitiveness and making sure that Canada remains a world-class destination for mining investments. We stand firmly behind this sector and the hard-working Canadians it employs. The Honourable Member for Bachasse Les Etchemins Levy. Mr. Speaker, what's going on when a Prime Minister has to defend Canada? What do we get? Radio silence. And yet, New Zealand has prohibited the use of uh, Huawei's uh, uh, equipment by Huawei in developing its 5G equipment. It's a security risk. The United States and Australia are doing the same thing. Why won't he ban Huawei in our 5G system, or will he fail once again to defend Canada's interests? 
Mr. Speaker, we have never compromised national security and we never will. Canada has solid uh, antecedents in protecting our people. We have experts who are working on this. Mr. Speaker, investments are very important and we are open to global investments which will help our economy and boost our growth. With respect to the 5G network, the technology is very important, but we want to make sure the Honourable Member for La Pointe and Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has proved that the government has completely underestimated the costs of the wave of migrants. But that that's only the uh, federal spending. For anything that really costs a lot of money, Quebec has to pay. Housing, social assistance, education, etc. The Ottawa Ottawa has put fifty million dollars to help out, but Ontario alone needs two hundred million. Quebec has received twelve times more migra migrants. When will Canada do the right thing and compensate Quebec as they should? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can assure my colleague that we are holding discussions with the government of Quebec. I was in Quebec City last week. I met with the minister, uh, Mr. Barrett. We will continue to work with the new Quebec government to make sure that we pay re some of the reasonable costs uh, associated with this irregular migration. Quebec is an important partner. We respect uh, their commitment and ours. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow uh, Canada will be signing a free trade agreement with North America. But our dairy producers are worried that th because now Americans will have a say in our supply management system. They are betraying Quebec producers. We want to make sure that this doesn't happen. Can the Prime Minister say that these provisions were withdrawn or has he once again failed to honour his word? The Honourable Minister. The government has defended our supply management system from a strong American attempt to dismantle it. Our poultry, eggs and, and, uh, and dairy provide the highest quality product for Canadians at a reasonable price and, uh, and, and keep the rural areas strong. We understand that there will be an impact on the farmers and we're committed to fully and fairly supporting them to make sure that the supply management system continues to expand through the centuries. Good job. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan, Mr. Speaker, on Friday the government is going to sign a new free trade agree agreement with the U.S. and Mexico. That's tomorrow and there's still no firm government commitment to compensate our dairy producers, the government has simply abandoned them in three agreements in a row, in our agreement with North America, in the TPP and in CETA. Will the government take its responsibility for these three betrayals and will it commit firmly to compensating, entirely compensating our supply managed producers for their losses in these three trade agreements? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, it's fair, my honourable colleague is well aware we're the party that implemented supply management and we're the party that's going to defend it. It's important to note that the Americans wanted to, to destroy our supply management system and our, our negotiators in government made sure that did not happen. We also understand there will be an impact on our farmers and we are going, committed to fully and fairly supporting them. Mr. Speaker, we have and will continue to support the supply management system in this country.